I'm Lynn Clark, and I make code cartoons. And I also work at Mozilla in advanced development. And today, I'm going to be talking about a possible future for Rust and the impact it could have on the programming world. I have to say, uh, it was quite an honor when I was asked to keynote this conference. You know, of course, it's always an honor when you're asked to keynote a conference, but that's not what I'm talking about here. It was an honor to be asked specifically to keynote RustConf. And that's because of what Rust has done and what Rust means. What I'm talking about is that Rust is really a leader in a whole new generation of programming languages and programming language communities. It's truly transformative. It's transforming the conversations we can have about what's possible. Now, I'm sure that many of you are aware of some of the things I'm referencing here. Uh, so the most well-known of these, of course, is how Rust is ushering in a whole new way of thinking about systems programming. And the impact of this is visible in a lot of different places. One recent example is the series of blog posts that Microsoft put out. You know, in these posts, they say, if only the developers could have all of the memory security guarantees of language li languages like .NET C Sharp combined with the efficiencies of C++, maybe we can with Rust. And they go on to say, rather than providing guidance and tools for addressing flaws, we should strive to prevent the developer from introducing the flaws in the first place. So we have one of the world's finest tool manufacturers saying, do we really need to build tools for this at all? What if we can make developers' lives easier without having to resort to tooling? And we have them asserting that Rust has opened up a different, more desirable possible future. Even if it were just for that, Rust would be an incredibly impactful language, blazing a new trail for other languages to follow. But it's not just that. Rust has also blazed a trail on a completely different front. And this one has more to do with technology's intersection with social issues. From the early days, Rust's core leadership understood that there was a problem with the way that our language communities work. They understood that if you looked around and saw faces, you saw people that only looked like you, that that meant that there was a flaw in the system a flaw that was keeping other people from having the same opportunities and reaching their full potential. And these leaders were very public and very vocal about the fact that they didn't think the responsibility for solving these problems lay on the shoulders of those most affected by them. But instead, they themselves intended to work towards fixing these problems. And this is one aspect of Rust's leadership that has affected me quite personally. When you come from an underrepresented group in tech, it can feel like you're swimming in a sea of unconscious bias and sometimes outward aggression. And seeing a beacon, seeing people waving a flag, saying that they're going to make space for you to join them, that can be the difference between leaving tech and finding a future in it. And I know this feeling. This is where things were for me when I first heard about Rust. And seeing those Rust leaders Seeing them waving this flag of inclusion gave me a place to swim towards. And that was actually a big part of me taking the job at Mozilla, knowing that I was going to be working at the same company as a lot of the people that were waving this flag. So I swam in that direction. I started working at Mozilla, and I wasn't working closely with the Rust team at that time, but I wanted to move in that direction. So after about a year, I started thinking about how I could do that. And it turned out that starting on that path would be a defining moment for me, even though it, I didn't end up exactly where I expected to be. I was coming from a role that dealt mostly with web technology, so I figured the best entry point for me with Rust would be web, uh, WebAssembly. The first most rudimentary support for Rust compiling to WebAssembly had landed at that point, and so I started playing around with that. Not long after I started down that path, I ran into a pivotal character in this story, and that's Luke Wagner. Now, if you don't know him, he's the person that had the key insight that led to ASM.js. And he was also a major driving force in turning web, uh, ASM.js into WebAssembly. So he's a co-creator of WebAssembly. He's also something of a nerd-sniping expert. 
Anyone who's worked with Luke can tell you how great he is at getting you excited about his ideas and making you really want to work to drive them with him. So I got a little bit waylaid on my journey, and I ended up not getting all the way to Rust, but ending up somewhere Rust adjacent. But as I was preparing this talk, I realized that's actually given me a really great vantage point to see another place where Rust is starting to blaze a trail. And that's because since those early days when I was first playing around with Rust compiled to WebAssembly, Rust has developed top-notch support for WebAssembly. The experience is so good, it's widely considered to be the best toolchain around for compiling to WebAssembly. And it's not just that Rust has a great implementation. Rust is also informing the specification, actively participating in shaping the future of WebAssembly. A big part of this is a project called WASM BindGen. This project was created to make it easier for Rust code that was compiled to WebAssembly to interoperate with JavaScript and Web APIs. Because at least up until now, WebAssembly has only been able to talk in numbers. If you had anything more complex, so you know, something that you wouldn't even think of being that complex, a string, that wouldn't work. You couldn't actually pass that back and forth. You'd have to write all this glue code in between to encode and decode this string. So Luke, expert nerd sniper that he is, found some folks to work with him to sort out this problem. He explained a few rough ideas to two people you might know, Alex Crichton and Nick Fitzgerald. And this was how Wasm Bindgen was born. It provided really ergonomic yet performant. Uh, it allowed a Rust programmer to stay at a high level using high level types when talking to JavaScript and to web APIs, despite WebAssembly's minimal type system. So it showed what was possible. And there started to be this virtuous cycle. With WebAssembly proposals around interoperability influencing WASM BindGen, and WASM BindGen influencing those proposals. And with this virtuous cycle, this is becoming a much bigger, much more impactful thing. It's moved past just interoperability with the web platform and on to interoperability with all of the things. So one example, you know, you could run a WebAssembly module using rich APIs with high-level types to talk to Python or Ruby or PHP when they're running in their own runtimes. And then you could turn around and take that same module and use it to directly talk to the host or to the operating system using the same high-level types, even though the types that that operating system understands are different from the types that Python understands. And then you could use those same high-level APIs when talking to a WebAssembly module compiled from a different source language. For example, you could have one that's compiled from Go interoperating with one that's compiled from Rust. Why would you want to do this? Why would you want to use it as a WebAssembly module in all of these different contexts? Well, there are a few reasons. If your app is in a scripting language like Python, then WebAssembly could be much faster. You could get near native performance without the hassle of compiling a native extension. If your app is in a lower level language like C++, then WebAssembly can give you lightweight sandboxing. The module can't access memory or other resources unless they've been directly handed to it. So this can make reusing code more secure. And for both scripting and lower level languages, being able to reuse code from any language ecosystem without having to rewrite it in your own language can help you move faster and can ease your maintenance costs. And this is an area where Rust is really primed to take the lead and set an example for other languages. Why is this? Well, it's for a couple of reasons. Rust already has really, a really good story around code reuse, with affordances like the module system and craze.io. And it already does have what's widely considered to be the best toolchain for compiling to WebAssembly. So Rust could blaze a trail here. And I know that I, for one, would really like to see that. I'd like to see Rust bring those technical values and those social values to a much broader community, to the union of all of these language communities. So I'm going to explain the proposal in more depth, and I hope that this helps you all think through what kind of impact Rust can have here. Now, there may be some things in this explanation that are review for you, uh, but I like to make sure that everybody's on the same page. So please bear with me for those parts. First, 
I'll start by explaining the initial problem that both the specification and WASM BindGen were trying to solve. And then I'll talk about the larger problem that they've moved on to since then. So like I, men like I mentioned, the initial problem was a more tractable one. How can WebAssembly interact with the web platform using high-level types? Now, this still isn't a tiny problem. Web API parameters and return values can be lots and lots of different types. So it could be hard to manually create mappings for these types. To simplify things, there's a standard way to talk about the structure of these types, which is called WebIDL. And you can actually do a pretty straightforward mapping between WebIDL and the types in other languages like JavaScript. So here we have an obvious solution. Just create a mapping from WebAssembly to WebIDL, just as there is for JavaScript. But that's not as straightforward as it may seem. For simple WebIDL types like Boolean and unsigned long, there are clear mappings from WebAssembly's numbers to WebIDL. But for the most part, WebIP web parameters are more complex types. So for example, an API might take a dictionary, which is basically an object with properties, or a sequence, which is basically an array. To have a straightforward mapping between WebAssembly types and these WebIDL types, we'd need to add some higher level types to WebAssembly. And we actually are doing that with the GC proposal. With that, WebAssembly modules will be able to create GC objects, things like structs and arrays, and those will be, you know, you'll be able to map those to the more complex WebIDL types. But if the only way to interoperate with these web APIs is through GC objects, that makes life harder for languages like Rust and C++ that wouldn't use GC objects otherwise. Whenever that code interoperates with a web API, it would have to create a new GC object and copy values from its linear memory into that object. But we want it to be just as easy for languages that use linear memory, like Rust and C++, to call web APIs as languages that use the browser's built-in GC. So we need a way to create a mapping between objects in linear memory and web IDL types as well. There's another problem here, though. Each of these languages, these linear memory languages, represents things differently in their linear memory. And we can't just pick one language's representation, because that would make things less efficient for the other languages. But even though the exact layout and memory for these is often different, there are some abstract concepts that are, they usually share in common. So for example, for strings, the language often has a pointer to the offset in memory, and a, a number indicating the length. So this means that we could reduce this string down to a type that WebAssembly does understand, 2 inch 32s. Now we could hard code this mapping into the engine, just like the JavaScript to WebIDL one is. You know, we could say that if this Web API is taking a string and I pass two numbers, just figure out what to do from there. But there's another problem here. WebAssembly is a type checked language. To keep things secure, the engine has to check that the calling code is passing in the right types, the ones that the callee expects. And this is because there are ways for attackers to exploit type mismatches and make the engine do things that it's not supposed to do. So if you're calling something that takes a string and try to pass an integer to it, the engine's gonna yell at you, and it should yell at you. So we need a way for a module to explicitly tell the engine something like, I know document create element uh, I know that that takes a string, but when I call it, I'm going to pass you two integers. Now use these to create a DOM string from my linear memory. And this is what an early version of the proposal did. It gave a WebAssembly module a way to map between the types that it uses and WebIDL types. Now these mappings aren't hard-coded in the engine. Instead, the module comes with its own little booklet of mappings. So get, this gives the module a way to say to the engine, for this function, do the type checking as if these two integers were a string. The fact that this booklet comes with the module is useful for another reason, though. Sometimes a module that would usually store its strings in linear memory would want to use a GC type in a particular case. So for example, if the module got something from JS and just wants to, to pass it to a web API. So modules need to be able to choose on a function by function or even an argument by argument basis how different types should be handled. And since the mapping is provided by the module, 
that can be custom tailored for that module. So how do we generate this booklet? Well, the compiler takes care of that for you. It adds a custom section to the WebAssembly module. So for many language tool chains, the programmer doesn't have to do very much work at all. So for example, let's take a look at how the Rust tool chain handles this for one of the simplest cases, where you're passing a string into the alert function. The programmer just has to tell the compiler to include this function in the booklet using the annotation was and bind gen. By default, the compiler will treat this as a linear memory string and add it the right mapping for that. And if you wanted it to be some other kind of string, you could add a little bit more to that annotation. So with this, we're able to provide really expressive mappings between a WebAssembly modules types and web ideal types. And we didn't have to make any kinds of compromises on what kinds of languages we support. It's possible to have all different kinds of languages compiling to WebAssembly, and all of them can map their types to web ideal types, whether the language uses linear memory or GC objects or both. Once we stepped back and looked at the solution, we realized there's actually a solution to the bigger, hairier problem here. And here's where we get back to that much larger potential for impact that I was talking about before. Is there a feasible way for WebAssembly to talk to all of these different things using all these different type systems? Let's look at the options. Like I talked about before, you could try to create mappings like the JS to WebIDL ones. But to do that, for each language, you have to create a specific mapping. And the engine would have to explicitly support all of these mappings and update them as the language on either side changes. And this creates a real mess. This is kind of how early compilers were designed. You know, there was a pipeline from each source language to each machine code language. I talked about this more in one of my early posts about WebAssembly, so you may have seen this image there before. We don't want something this complicated. We want it possible for all different kinds of languages and platforms to talk to each other, but we want it to be scalable as well. So we need a different way to do this, more like modern day compiler architectures. These have a split between the front end and the back end. The front end goes from the source language to an abstract intermediate representation, or IR. And then the back end goes from that IR to the target machine code. This is where the insight from WebIdeal comes in. When you squint at it, WebIDL kind of looks like an IR. Now, WebIDL is pretty specific to the web, and there are lots of use cases for WebAssembly outside of the web, so WebIDL itself isn't really a great IR for us to use. But what if you just use WebIDL as inspiration and create a new set of abstract types? This is how we got to the WebAssembly interface types proposal. These types aren't concrete types. They aren't like the inch 32 or the float 64 in WebAssembly today. There are no operations on them in WebAssembly. So for example, we won't be adding any string concatenation operations to WebAssembly. Instead, all operations are performed on the concrete types on either side. There's one key point that makes this possible. With the interface types, the two sides aren't trying to share a representation. Instead, the default is to copy values between one side and the other side. So this makes it a lot easier for a single module to talk to many different languages because it decouples them. In some cases, like the browser, the mapping from the interface types to the host's concrete types will be baked into the engine. So one set of mappings will be baked in at compile time, and the other is handed to the engine at load time. But in other cases, when you have two WebAssembly modules that are talking to each other, they'll both send down a little booklet. They both have that booklet that maps their types to the uh, abstract types, the interface types. Now, one thing I forgot to mention here is that these, uh, the instructions that you use for defining these are actually declarative. You know, you use instructions, but there's no loops or other control flow mechanisms that would turn this into a Turing complete instruction set. So what do these instructions look like? Well, before I get into that, I should say this proposal is still under development. Um, so the, what I'm showing you here is very likely to change before it's all said and done. And also, this is all handled by the compiler. So even when this proposal is finalized, you'll only need to know what annotations your tool chain expects to be in your source code. You won't actually need to know how this works under the covers. But the details of this proposal are pretty neat, so I'm going to show you the current thinking. 
So let's say we want to take a function that would return a string. Except WebAssembly doesn't have strings, so it returns two integers. What we would do in our mapping is say, call export, so this would call that function and put the two integers on the stack. And then we would use memory to string. So that instruction tells the engine to use these two integers to take the bytes from linear memory and turn it into the abstract string. The immediate value there, the mem, um, that tells the engine which memory object to operate on. And then the engine pops off those two integers and uses them to find the string in there. And it creates the abstract string, which is basically just a sequence of code points. Um, and then that's ready to be translated into the concrete type on the other side. What does this look like in reverse? Like if we were trying to take a string as a parameter. In that case, we'd use string to memory. So this would go from the abstract string to the concrete string type in our linear memory. So we'd do an R get to put a reference to the abstract string on the stack. And then we would call string to memory. And the first immediate here does the same thing that the uh, memory to string one did. It tells you what memory to operate on. And then the second tells the engine which allocator function to use when allocating the bytes here. So this is how the declarative mapping works. And there's a really nice side effect to it being declarative. The engine can see when the translation is actually unnecessary, when you know, the two modules on either side are already using the same type. And then the engine can skip a lot of the steps in between. So that's how all of this works under the hood. But if you want to use this, you actually don't need to know any of that. The proposal really makes this whole experience pretty seamless. So now I want to show you that. And again, I should warn you, like I said before, early stage proposal, that means that things are changing rapidly and you should not use this in production. But if you want to start playing with it, we've implemented this across the tool chain from production to consumption. So in the Rust tool chain, in WASM bind gen, and in the WebAssembly runtime WASM time. And since uh, people on our team are maintainers on all of these tools, and we also are working um, on the standardization itself, we can keep up with the standard as it develops. Even though all of these parts will continue changing, we're synchronizing the changes. So as long as you're using up-to-date versions of all of these, you shouldn't have things breaking on you too much. So now, on to the demo. And I have to say, I have a healthy fear of the demo gods, so these are actually all recorded. <laughs> to show off how this works, we need a WebAssembly module that uses interface types. So let's go ahead and make one. And since I've been talking about strings so much, I'll use one that takes strings and returns strings. So a markdown parser. And since I'm not this module's author, I'll do this by wrapping functionality with uh, the functionality of this module with my own module. So, um, so I'll create a render function and uh, that uses string types and annotate it with the WASM bind gen macro. And this does all the magic. It knows how the, the various string types in Rust should be mapped to the WebAssembly string type. And then I'll compile it using WASM pack and the WASM interface types flag, which is needed right now because this is experimental. So this gives us that single WASM file that we can use in all of these different environments. For our first environment, let's try something like pure WebAssembly. This is a standalone runtime. So I'll download WASMTime from wasmtime.dev, and then we can run this module and pass it a markdown string. And you see the WebAssembly module took that markdown string and returned the HTML string. Even though the runtime doesn't know anything about how Rust strings work, they were able to communicate with each other using these high-level types. So that was easy and straightforward. But what about Python? Can we use this markdown parser there? Yes, we can, and we might want to for the speed. To do this, we download the WASM time extension, and this makes it possible for Python modules to call WebAssembly functions. And then all I need to do is import the extension and the markdown module, and then I can call the render function. Now we can run this. There we go. And again, it works. 
The types were different this time. We're passing in Python values, but it still just works. And this is because of that magic of interface types. The same file runs in the same way. We can also use the same WebAssembly module in Rust. One reason you'd want to use the WebAssembly module here is for lightweight sandboxing that I was talking about before. You know, this isolates this third-party code from the rest of your application. So let's look at how this works. So we add WASM time Rust as a dependency, and this does the same thing as the Python extension. And then in the main file, we add the WASM time Rust macro, and then add a trait, and we're going to add a render method as part of that trait. But we won't add an implementation here where you might expect it. Instead, the WebAssembly module is going to be that implementation. So the macro just wires that up for us. It also adds in other methods on that trait, like load file, which instantiates a WebAssembly module from a file. So in the main function, we'll call load file to instantiate the module. And then we'll call render. And something that's important to note here, um, the result is actually strongly typed. So it can be used exactly in the same way as a natively compiled version of this functionality. So now let's use cargo to run it. And again, it just works, except with a different environment using different types. Now this might not seem impressive since we compiled the original version from Rust, but it would work just as seamlessly even if this were compiled from Go or C++ as long as that module was using interface types. So where else can we make this work? I don't have enough time to show you, but it already works in Node and the web as well through WASM BindGen. And that's the same Rust module compiled to WebAssembly. And we're using it, the same rich API and types to talk to five wildly different runtimes and languages. And those are just a few examples. There's no reason this can't work in other languages and other runtimes, many more of them. So I hope this helps illuminate the potential here. The potential for Rust to bring the many things that have made it so impactful, the technical values and the social values, directly to the rest of the programming world. Because that is a possible future now. And I know it's a future that many of us would like to see. I want to thank the people who have been working on this, the folks that have been working on the specification, and a huge thanks to the folks that worked on the demo. They did a tremendous job incorporating WebAssembly into all of these environments. Um, and they also are very involved in all of the Rust and WebAssembly work. So if you want to learn more about how you can incorporate WebAssembly into another language or runtime, they're definitely good people to talk to. I also want to thank my fantastic collaborators, uh, Till Schneiderate and Luke Wagner, for their invaluable input on both the talk and the post around this. And thank you all for listening.